Hi, I'm Chris Poland, and you're watching The Metal Voice. This is Neil Turpin. We're here at uh, Downtown Rehearsal with the one and only Chris Poland. Hey, Neil. Formerly of Megadeth, but uh, in our hearts of music, uh, you know, you're still a Megadeth uh, on, the, on the vinyl and on the, on the songs, and we can still listen to you and still uh, learn about what you're up to these days and awesome. what's going on here uh, and ask you a few questions. Whatever you want to know. Cool. Thank you, Chris. Thank you. And thanks to Tom Hazer for putting it all together for us here. And uh, you know, I rehearsed in your building here. I just didn't. I never got to go to the secret room here. Everybody has. Earlier on, you had a hand injury. Oh yeah. And and what exactly happened? And how did that affect you know your your playing and your technique and kind of because it's like Tony Iommi in a sense, right? Because he had uh, yeah certainly a hand injury, but it didn't stop him. And right, in fact, it right. it propelled him in a in a further direction, and it kind of defined it defined heavy music really. It was an accident that happened at school. There was like a nine pane um, oak door with, with frosted glass that didn't have a safety wire in it. And um, something happened, you know, in the hallway. All my books got knocked down. The guy ran and, like, you know, we did it on purpose. So I chased him. And he went to run into, I think it was the lab. And he slammed the door, but the hydraulic was not working on the door. And I put my hands up, and this hand hit the uh, wood, and this hand hit the glass, and it broke. And then he opened the door up really quick to see if I was all right, and it just shredded my hand. Yikes. Yeah, so it's just, Ouch. you know, it's like my pinky and my, my pointer finger are, are a little jacked up. So how, how does that affect how you approach playing and how you... Um... I can only play the way I play. You know, I play everything like this. Okay. Or I do triads like this, you know, and my finger's always up. You know, if I start thinking about what my hand looks like when I'm playing, I freak out. So I never, I don't look at my hand while I'm playing in that way. I don't go, hey, your finger's hanging out in the middle of the, you know. But it does, and it's just a weird thing, and that's how I get around it. Yeah, and I don't want to, you know, ask questions that are painful or things that, you know, oh, I, I don't are disturbing care. to you, no, but that's it's just, you know, kind of the... the Oh, like, and, there, and there's no fixing it. You know, doctors have told me, you know, if we do anything, you'll never, might not ever even be able to bend your finger. So I just deal with it. And this is all in school. This is way before Megadeth. Even. Oh, yeah, this is before I even lived in California. Now, were you playing a lot of guitar in those days? Oh, yeah. I just bought uh, Mahavishnu Orchestra, Birds of Fire. I was learning stuff off that. I, I had, um, oh some blues band I can't remember what it was but I was learning all this stuff and then I came home you know from the hospital and in a huge cast where my hand was like this with a cast around it so it was just this huge block and that was on there for a long time and then it went smaller and smaller and then finally when they took the cast off my my right my left arm was all atrophied and the first thing I did was tried to play guitar and I realized I couldn't bend my finger ouch and, you know, the doctor told my mom I'd never be able to play guitar again. And so I was like, well, I'm going to try. And then once I tried, I said, well, I can still play. I just can't play like I did before. And I just learned a different way. So you had to reinvent your, your style of, or way of playing. Yeah, it's weird. And um, the only thing that's affecting me now because I've gotten older is my thumb has been in a strange position for so long that my knuckle right here every once in a while, you know, like tells on me, you know. But that's about it. Well, you just got to keep on rocking, man. Yeah, no, yeah, exactly. <laughs> I just, the more I play, the less it hurts. <laughs> so, um, so as far as uh, other styles of music, other types of, uh, you know, influences, I know you have, you had Ohm, and um, just some of the other... Uh, influences for me are, um, you know, when I was a kid, it was, it was uh, Jeff Beck, uh, Jimmy Page, Leslie West, Hendrix, uh, then it was Jeff Beck into McLaughlin, and then for like 
for a long time all I listened to was fusion. But I still would go back and listen to like rock stuff and but but I wasn't I wasn't like a real heavy metal fan. I was exposed to a lot of it by from Dave. Like Dave turned me on to uh, Merciful Fate and stuff like that and I really liked it and but if I hadn't met Dave I would have never even I learned a lot from Mustaine on you know guitar wise rhythm wise and how to do spider chords and there's a lot that um that I took from that experience so when so um, I know I'm going off a little bit backwards but back on Dave Mustaine I was just wondering uh, in terms of you know the Metallica influence in him uh did you find that you know he was kind of moving away in some aspects you know you know, in other words, he 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 brought a lot to Metallica in the first place. So obviously, Metallica is a representation of what he put in his input. But you know, as we all grow and and learn things and maybe change a bit from our influences or our surroundings, would you say that you know there was definitely a, 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 t a way where he was kind of moving into the Dave Mustaine mode versus the Metallica mode? In other words, well, they, they were young when they were doing that, and they were you know you guys. I were mean, I think Dave was was probably writing um, probably more than half of the stuff when they were together so I think they had their idea of how things should be and Dave had his idea and that's why the bands are so different you right. know and it's obvious you know that even the fans I mean there's fans that like like I like Metallica as much as I like Megadeth but um, they are different animals you know Dave's music is a little bit more uh, complicated but not not like in difficulty to play just like idea wise at least at the beginning I mean you know well not really I mean you know there's there got to a point where it seemed like Dave was trying to to maybe like get more radio play right and but then I think on on the, the last record I think he kind of said fuck it if I'm radio or no so that last record I thought was really good there was a lot of really good songs on it and there was a lot of good songs on the on the, the the system has failed too. But then there were those songs where you would never he hear that on, like say, Peace Sells. That like there's a ballad on that song. It's a beautiful song, but it's really not a Megadeth song. But it, it is, you know, because Dave wrote it. So there's that point where even Metallica did it. You know, they started to lean towards playing more of like what everybody might like. And there's nothing wrong with that. You know, they got to. I, ha I have a hard time doing that. I can only write what comes to me, you know. I can't I can sit write. down and go, yeah, I'm going to write this song because it might get played on radio. I only, if I pick up a guitar or something happens, that's what I write. I don't go, let me see, how did that song go? I'll write a song just like it. I don't do that. Well, so much more contrived. I'm not saying those guys do that either, but I just only write what I write, and that's it. That's, well, why, so that's why I'm kind of an obscure you know, musician. Well, it's so much more contrived when you're trying to write, you know, a hit song or a journey song or something that, hey, we'll get a radio play versus something that's like, this is what I'm feeling. And here's what I, here's a riff I have or here's some idea or a thought or a right, right. vibration or whatever I, it is. Yeah, I'm sure my wife and daughter wish that I would do that more. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, maybe I will on this record. I don't know. I have a lot of stuff that's been, you know, in my head and on my phone. Oh, cool. So by, by the way, I do the same thing Kurt Hammett does. Every idea I have is on my phone. Oh, that's awesome. And so I'm, it's, I'm not going to set up every, turn everything on, get mic levels, and, you know, I just put my phone out there and I get it, the idea down and then it's over. <laughs> so do you, do you go back to some of these ideas that you had, let's say, you know, six years ago? Oh, yeah. 18 years ago? I mean, if I have if a, a song, phone even yeah, does, no, does I have that. a song that I wrote long before I was in Megadeth that I'm going to show... Um, Carlos and Peg. That's great. Yeah. With uh, Megadeth, when you guys, uh, f you know, got your your album advance, I guess when uh, I don't know if that would be the first album that you got an advance for, but you know, maybe one of the future uh, albums. I just wonder, did all of the money go for? Uh, oh no. Substances or did, no, no, did most of it go for that no, for the band? And, and first of all, when we got any money, it was in Dave's account. You know, nobody got. We got a per diem where we got. You know. A couple hundred bucks a week to so live. So Dave on. got the money. Dave got the money, and, and you guys got. A and and this this myth that the first record was, you know, spent on drugs is bullshit. We only had like I think it was six or eight thousand dollars to make a record, and we made it in a couple of weeks, and 
drugs aren't that expensive. <laughs> you know, it's like, right. At and and time, it, it wasn't, we weren't even like that far gone then. It was just, you know, we had Cliff Colteri was up there from, and, you know, he br- actually brought amps up there for us. If it wasn't for Cliff Colteri, I wouldn't have gotten solos on the, on the first record. He, he asked Dave to give me solos because I wasn't going to get a bunch of solos. So I thank um, Cliff for that. Rest in peace. And yeah, even even there's no P money cells, to spend. Even P cells, I think our budget was twenty six thousand. But we were in really nice studios, and it cost money. And it cost money, and you guys got to eat food while you're in the studio. Yeah, you gotta yeah. And plus, we were still getting get some bills our, paid. We still had our two hundred dollars a week from you know that we lived on, and it's not like we were going. Dave, I needed five thousand dollars to go. You know, nobody that never, nobody would ever ask. Even, you know, to say, hey, I need money to go pick up. We would never ask Dave for that unless, you know, it was during the week and some, if you're out of money, hey, Dave, can you front me 20 bucks, you know, until payday, you know. I don't even remember ever doing that. So here we are inside of Chris Poland's studio. Pretty awesome to be here. And there's Chris. This is what, this is what we get stuff into the computer with. And then we use some Neve stuff over here for the kick and snare. That's some fancy pants stuff and yeah, nice sound. It's okay. But um, this is pretty nice. I had I had an Allen Smart C2, and I did some research on this, and even Carlos agrees it's as, it's as good as that without the crush. So, but this, uh, this thing I'm really proud of. I, I love these little boards, man. The SSL, uh, the x oh, yeah. and the X-Panda because you can sum everything and it gives you that SSL like headroom. We're yeah. not probably gonna mix in here, but we could. That's amazing. If we wanted to. But um, I have, um, I like to go through, when I go to tape, I like to go through this so that I get this vibe of this thing being pushed almost into the red, going into the computer and that way it gives it a little bit more juice. You know? I was reading about you know, when you left Megadeth and um, just trying to fathom, you know, the, the similarities between some things that you might have went through and perhaps myself, but, you know, the money thing, there just wasn't, I didn't have any money from what I was doing till later on. I mean, I just didn't get paid when I was in the band right, I was in. Right. I mean, it just didn't exist, you know. $5 to go to Denny's would be, you know, if they put uh, the $5 in, <laughs> yeah, $5 in my hand would be like, wow, that's a lot, you know. Speaking <laughs> of Denny's, I was busing tables from midnight to 8 a.m. at Denny's after I left Megadeth. And I would be busing tables and, you know, on a weekend, and some guy would go, dude, you're Chris Poland. <laughs> and I'd have to go, yeah, I am. <laughs> and it was so weird because he just looked at me like, dude, what the fuck are you doing here? And um, I would just say, hey, man, I got to eat. Doing I what you got to do. I got to pay the rent. There's no, there's no shame in working hard. And but when you think of it now, it is pretty crazy because at that time, Megadeth was beyond gold. Peace Cells was really like a, like, like a train, you know. And here I am busting tables in the middle of the night at Denny's. <laughs> yeah, but you worked hard, and you know now you're in the awesome studio and oh yeah, out no, great I mean music. no, I, 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 I somewhat got it together. I mean we're still struggling to. But but that was a time where it was a struggle. A real oh, struggle. yeah, it was terrible. And, and it was also like, you know, of course, Megadeth was a well-known band and doing well. And, you know, all the inner workings and all the, the in intricacies and, and all that, the relationships, you know, and, and then... The I, also, I also had shit happen where, like, I'd be at the beach with my girlfriend and there'd be, like, a, like six guys walking down the boardwalk in Venice wearing Megadeth shirts. And at the time, my girlfriend said, hey, you guys, you know who this is? This is Chris Poland from Megadeth, and they would just go, "Yeah, right, fuck off," and then walk away. <laughs> <laughs> so I've I've had every little version of, of weirdness from being in that band. Let me tell you. So looking back, um, do you think you made the the right decision when you left Megadeth? And I guess that's the question. That's you know, did you leave or did things happen in such a way that? Um, it didn't really it was just meant to be. It got it, it got to the point where it was just time that it wasn't working for anybody anymore. So, um, who knows what would have happened if I stayed in the band? 
it was probably best that I didn't. <laughs> And I can understand, you know, I mean, relationships, I mean, there's people that stay married for 50 years and right. want to kill each other, and then there's ones that love each other and never, you know, Well, I think it argue. would have been, th that wouldn't have been the issue. Probably drugs would have killed somebody or all of us. Who knows? So in the time that you left uh, Megadeth, would you say that the people in the band were still into the drugs and even yourself? Oh, yeah. No, I mean, that's that's all documented in books and... So it was chaos. I mean, yeah, it was, it's, it was, it's crazy when everybody's like not in their right mind. <laughs> and, and I mean, things can be happy one day and not unhappy the next day or oh, the yeah. next moment. Yeah, that. no, that was, that was, you know, any given day. <laughs> and that's not just alcohol, but that's like a bad trip or a bad experience or, oh, don't have something, withdrawal. Oh, yeah. <laughs> that was a Don't problem. have the money. Yeah. Well, it's not that you don't have the money. You're just in a strange city. And, um. You know, what are you going to do? Are you going to ask somebody at 7-Eleven? <laughs> right. And I know it's a hard topic to even really discuss, but in that respect, do you, do you find that while you guys were in that state of mind or in that state of existence, you know, on the road, was there certain unique challenges that you experienced uh, because everyone was, or some of the band uh, were using, and to a point where, you know, you know, you know like when someone's, drinking a little too much and right. I mean I know it's different than that but if someone's drinking a little too much and they're having to get on stage and play in front of some people and um, you know they went a little too far maybe they had a, a few too many or well, that's I mean and then they can't even stand up and they're falling backwards yeah know? that was the show at the Ritz that um, that's pretty famous that everybody already knows about but the thing the main thing was is you know you had to time your buzz if if you're gonna go on stage sick you had to drink a lot right before you went on and and you wouldn't get drunk you just would be able to stand up and do it you know and that was what was terrible it's like that would go on for a couple of weeks until everybody dried out you know so is that something you had to do yeah. personally and is that something that other members had to do in the band in other words you're doing it at the same time you're kind of on the same wavelength yeah, you know, that? some were worse than others but you know at the time that time Ellison, he was pretty much okay i mean you know, he'd had the sniffles a couple of days, and that was it. <laughs> you know? And what about Gar Samuelson? Oh, yeah, Gar and me. You know, it would take a couple of weeks to to uh, get over what we had been doing before we'd go out on the road. Hey, so, Neil, I just want to say we were just talking about all the crazy fighting and stuff that went on in Megadeth. It was kind of like when you fight with a, your brother or something. I mean, we never... There wasn't a lot of grudges held when we would do that because we were not in our right minds. And I never ever like was, you know, there was days where I was pissed for a day, but you know, it's not like we were, like when we knew we had to do shit, we just got our things done and, and you know, things like that didn't happen all the time, but when they did, it was a pretty big deal. <laughs> you like Bruce Lee too. Oh yeah, <laughs> everybody likes Bruce yeah. Lee. <laughs> Me too. Wow, well this is such a cool, cool place and um, Here's your old school Ampex tape. Yeah, we used uh, that machine to make a record called Chasing the Sun. Nice. Well, it wasn't exactly that machine. That machine was way older than this one, but that's the same machine I use. That's why I have that one, just in case. If you wouldn't believe it, if you take the two track from the computer and run it into that and play it after it's hit the tape, you wouldn't believe the, what it adds to the to the uh, to the two track. And over here is Chasing the Sun, right? That's a, that's what this is right here. Yeah, that's the first uh, artwork. It's, Beautiful. It's changed since then, but wow, you got such cool stuff in here. And then over here, I noticed this. That's why I wanted to come into the room as well, because we have these uh, these gold awards. This is all platinum. just for peace cells, though. That's all right. Yeah, I, I I'm pretty sure we should have one for. Uh, killing by now it's just so cool to be in here and to, to hang out with you the the relationship that you have today with dave mustaine or megadeth do you guys uh haven't spoke to dave. at all or? no not since um the system has failed has anyone in the megadeth camp whether it be managers or nope. publicists or anyone ever reached out or nope. nothing like that mm -mm. i can relate yeah <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah but um but, but eventually I got reached out to for some little video thing, but you know, it wasn't like 
hey man, let's get the, yeah, yeah. the party back together. Right. Would you ever consider going back to Megadeth if they called you up and said, hey, Chris, you know, we're doing something and mm, we'd uh, like to... I don't, I don't think so. We'd like to throw some money at you and... Uh, no, I mean, if Dave did a solo thing, maybe, but I, I'm not... I don't want to learn all those Megadeth songs. <laughs> no way. And then how am I going to do Marty Friedman solos? You know? Yeah, Marty's pretty awesome. But yeah. uh, you're pretty awesome too, so I don't think you'd have a problem. I'm sure you're aware that Dave Ellefson and Jeff Young have recently reunited together outside of Megadeth. Who's and, that? Yeah, I'm trying to remember. <laughs> I just saw actually great people. I just saw Dave. I just did a gig with Dave over at the Ultimate Jam Night at the Whiskey. Oh, cool. And they were doing a, a tribute to the Big Four, so Dave Ellison and right. Jeff Young were both playing. And I thought to myself right at that moment when I saw them in the dressing room, the whiskey, like, well, why isn't Chris Poland in this room with us? Oh, no, uh, I'm doing, um, I think it's in November. I'm doing a thing with those guys in November in Chicago. Wow, you just answered my question already. Yeah. <laughs> so you're, so I was going to ask you if you would consider joining up with Dave Ellison and Jeff Young. So yeah. you're you're already doing that. Yeah, yeah. That's cool, so yeah. cool. Yeah, Dave sent me a text and said, hey, you want to do this? I said, yeah. Uh, from being in Megadeth, would you say that, um, you know, your writing, your your perspective, your your approach to music, your um, your life experience, I mean, would you say that oh, absolutely. before and after you were a completely different made a person? Big, made a big difference. Just, I mean, musically it did... Um, you know, even financially, it, it's helped, you know, so it was the right thing to do, and it lasted as, just as long as it was supposed to, you know, and um, I'm really proud of all that, you know, music, all three of the records I played on, so. What's going on today, and you know, oh. what music you're working on, because, uh, you know, we know you've, you've moved on a long time ago oh, right. from Megadeth, but of course the fans want to always ask the questions, and of course everybody wants to know all the, the de intimate, juicy details. Yeah, yeah. We have um, Carlos Cruz from Warbringers, our drummer. Oh, wow. Great, and, great uh, drummer. Great mm, guy. Really good. Um, was just fit right in. And he actually, he, he got us together after Nick passed just to get us out of our funk because it was a long time before we even, you know, felt like playing. And one day um, um, he just you know, suggested that we get together, and we did. And then it started, he came in, he knew like 10 of our songs, like, like better than we knew them. That's great. And so we've been going from there, and he's right now, at a, he's on the road right now for a couple of weeks, but when he gets back, we're gonna finish a record that, that uh, we have a record deal with uh, M Theory Audio. Nice. And um, they released a, a song called Exit Stage Left, which I had forgotten when I named it that there was a Rush song <laughs> called that. <laughs> but um, <laughs> yeah, but but it was in my mind it it was a song that we had worked on with Nick, and I just felt like I wanted you know that song is definitely about Nick for me. And um, anyway, so they released that as a kind of a teaser for the record. It's been on online. You can look it up and listen to it. But. Um, yeah, we have to finish the record when Carlos gets back, and we have a lot of material, so it should go well. That's great. And um, are you recording that here? Yeah. Or, what's the name of your recording studio? It's called Glass House. And you're telling me a little story. Someone named it. Yeah, I I, th I think Donnie Sarian named it, and I just never named it, so that's what it's been called ever since. How oh, cool! <laughs> well, thank you, Chris. It's it's a real honor for me and a, and a privilege, and uh, I'm really you know appreciative to, to finally come and meet meet up with you in your studio yep. and in your my hideaway your abode here <laughs> humble abode in, the, in beautiful downtown Los Angeles and um, you know it's it's just so cool to, to talk about these times that uh, you experienced and, right. and these experiences because uh, you know no one else was there that can really explain it this way I appreciate it <laughs>